Et salut, bonsoir tout le monde et bienvenue à ce quatrième épisode du Alex Sereno Show. Et euh, ce soir, j'ai vraiment, mais vraiment un, un épisode où je me gâte et je vous gâte, vous, si vous êtes euh, bien entendu un fan de triathlon et de sport de très haut niveau, parce que j'ai demandé à deux de mes très, très euh, bons amis de très longue date et entraîneurs extraordinaires de triathlon, de participer à cet épisode-là parce que, ben, parce que je trouve qu'ils sont vraiment exceptionnels comme entraîneurs et euh, parce que je pense qu'ils ont euh, changé un peu le, le, le portrait du, de ce sport-là au pays et même au niveau international. Donc, euh, donc j'aurais demandé s'ils avaient une petite heure à m'accorder afin qu'on jase euh, justement de triathlon. Comme vous le savez, c'est une de mes passions dans la vie, le coaching, le coaching de triathlon plus précisément. Et euh, ces deux bons amis avec qui j'ai eu la chance de travailler au fil des ans depuis euh, au moins les derniers 20 ans. Et on a vécu plein de choses extraordinaires ensemble. Donc, euh, je voulais vous faire partager ce moment-là euh, ce soir. Donc, euh, je vous rappelle, on est en direct. Puis une des raisons pour qu'on est en direct chaque mercredi soir à 19h30, c'est pour vous donner l'occasion de participer, de venir poser vos questions à nos différents invités. Donc, ce soir, si vous êtes un fan, comme je disais, de triathlon, sport de haut niveau, vous allez être vraiment gâtés parce que ce sont deux sommités euh, qui ont accepté d'être présents avec nous euh, lors de, de l'épisode. Donc, euh, pour les besoins de l'épisode ce soir, l'épisode sera en anglais. Alors, euh, mais gênez-vous pas, si vous avez des, des questions à poser euh, en français, je vais les traduire à nos deux invités. Euh, D'ailleurs, l'un d'eux, vient du Québec aussi, fait qu'il comprend et parle très bien aussi le français. Mais euh, pour rendre la chose un peu plus euh, facile, on va faire l'entrevue en anglais. Donc, avant de vous introduire mes deux euh, coachs préférés, qui sont Cliff English et Craig Taylor, j'aimerais prendre quelques minutes encore juste pour vous introduire comme il faut, donner un petit peu plus de contexte sur leur biographie comme entraîneur, puis vous allez voir, vous allez avoir vraiment un super show ce soir. Donc, je transfer en anglais à l'instant même. So, Coach Cliff English. Uh, Cliff has been coaching for 30 years with over 20 years of elite high performance coaching. He began coaching in Montreal with the uh, McGill Triathlon Club and also with the DDO Triathlon team. He then moved to Victoria, BC in 2002, where he completed his diploma in high performance coaching at the University of Victoria. While in Victoria, Coach Cliff started Cliff, uh, cliffenglishcoaching.com, which is his private coaching uh, business. He then coached Samantha McGlone to the 2004 Canadian Olympic team, uh, Olympic Games. In 2005, he was hired as the USA Triathlon Elite National Team coach until the Beijing Games. 2016, he was hired at Arizona State, is now heading uh, the program, uh, the triathlon program there, and has won five NCAA championship. Some career highlights include four-time Olympic coach, 2004 to 2016, three times world champion coach, 2006 USA men ITU team relay world champions, 2006 70.3 world champion with Sam McGlone, 2009 ITU Long Course World Champion Tim O'Donnell, a uh, few podiums at uh, Ironman Hawaii, a few podiums also at 70.3 uh, World Championship. It's got 100 or so of pro wins in Ironman, 70.3 in non draft races, 100 or so podiums worldwide in ITU and Ironman in 70.3. And as I said before, five NCAA national championships. Among some of the notable athletes he's coached in the last 20 years, to name a few, only Sam McGlone, Tim, Tim O'Donnell, Heather Jackson, Peter Reed, Hunter Kemper, Ashley Gentle, Sarah Asking. So really a really good coach. Another great coach is Craig Taylor, really good friend of mine, helped me a lot through my Uh, my two uh, Olympic campaigns, one with Kathy Trombley and one with Emily Kretz uh, this last summer. So Coach Craig has a bachelor's degree in kinesiology and a master's degree from the University of Toronto. He's NCCP CompDev certified. Started his career in 1996 as a part-time coach running camps, clinics, and online coaching. And he co-founded the University of Toronto Triathlon Clubs in 99. 
From 2005-2007, he was an intern coach at the NTC in Victoria, where he enrolled in the National Coaching Institute as Cliff. From 2007-2010, he was uh, Ontario's provincial coach at the newly created Ontario Provincial Triathlon Centre, hosted at the University of Guelph. From 2010-2017, he was staff coach for Triathlon Canada, head coach of the Regional Triathlon Centre in Guelph. Where he, wor where he worked with the likes of Emily Kretz, Joanna Brown, Jason Wilson, Andrew York. He's now gone back to private coaching and consulting in Guelph, Ontario. Coach Craig coached at Canada Games, Pan Am Games, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, and multiple ITU Continental and World Championship. He's coached athletes to more than a dozen national championships and podium performances at Continental Cup, World Cups, WTS, and World Championships. U23. He's also coached three Olympians. But most importantly to him, he's proud to say that over 95% of the junior and U23 athletes he's coached and supervised obtained their graduate degree with approximately 25% going on to a second degree or graduate studies. Sorry. So I think now you know that we have really two amazing coaches. So I hope you're going to appreciate this show and please participate actively and ask all questions for the next 60 minutes. Without uh, without waiting anymore, here's Coach Cliff and Coach Craig. Vous écoutez le Alex Sereno Show. Hey guys, how are you doing? Hey. I'm, I'm just like, this was a, you guys have such a CV. I was reading through this and I'm like, man, these guys are just amazing. So, so thanks for accepting to uh, to be part of this episode number four, guys. And uh, we're gonna have some fun tonight. So, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm really good. Um, it's probably colder here where I am than where Cliffy is, I imagine. But I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm doing good, Alex. Thanks for having us. Well, guys, the idea behind this podcast is super simple. I, I like I like to have people that really found their passion and in you know and and they're and they're really where they should. In French, we say être sur son X, so being where you should be and living through your passion. And I think you guys are two really good example. But you guys also have a really amazing background in terms of coaching. You've been around for a few years. I'm I'm lucky to say that you're both friends. I've had you know the opportunity to coach with both of you on you know different occasions. I remember Cliff. We coached, you know, back in 2000, you know, DDO and with, with you know, the Quebec program. So, and and Craig, I, I've always said that Craig's helped me in the, those last two campaigns. He's got, he's such a great analyst and helped me not only in coaching and supporting, but he's helped me navigate the selection criteria, which is sometimes it's it's tricky in our sports. So, <laughs> so, the, so anyways, I, I like really felt it. it was a really good opportunity to talk to you guys. So. So just to put people in, now we know your CV, but I'm interested in knowing, you know, where you start as a coach, you know, where do you get into coaching for say, you know, in triathlon? So I'll, I'll start with you, Cliff. You know, yeah, I get asked that a lot. It's interesting. Um, and I think I change my answer every time, but uh, <laughs> I was an athlete, you know, and then that didn't work out. And, <laughs> um <laughs> You know, and, and and it was just a natural progression for me, to be honest. Uh, it was, you know, one of these things that uh, I was I was already, you know, personal training, coaching masters, doing a lot of stuff and helping a lot of people. I was always one of those people that for some reason I it made sense to me and I can explain it to people. Um, my failed career as a triathlete didn't make sense to me. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, hey, you know, I'm better at helping people, better at, you know, figuring stuff out and. It was kind of interesting though, because I think, um, you know, compared to a lot of people, and I think even you, Craig, are just very different paths. You know, I, I kind of consider myself kind of like the working class coach. I was someone that was always in the trenches, and I made a lot of mistakes as an athlete, and that really made me a better coach. You know, I kind of was very stubborn, very hard headed. You know, I needed to make a lot of mistakes, and um, you know, and a lot of mistakes of myself. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, I think that's the biggest thing you can do in life, right? You got to learn, you know, if you don't learn from any of the mistakes, you're just going nowhere. So I've always been a pretty quick learner and uh, having the experiments of, uh, you know, being, being an athlete for, you know, about 
you know, 10, 12, 15 years type of thing, learned a lot. So that was really good. And that's pretty much how it started, you know, just uh, coached and coached. And it, it's kind of interesting. It's always weird when you're asked to come up with a CV or to go like, I can't even remember most of the, the results. Now there was so many that you forget and so many, like, it's kind of fun to go back and maybe that's just cause I'm getting older now too. And I can't remember stuff, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think the fun thing is, is you don't think about that. Like that's, that's where I'm at. Like I meet a lot of people that talk about, Oh, Hey, you know, your legacy. And it was never something I ever thought about. Like you do your job and you do it well. If you're doing it well, you're getting results. And that's how I've always been from the very beginning. You know, I never thought like, oh, I want to have this many wins or this or that. Like, it's just like, do your job. You know, I'm not going to swear, but effing well. And and that's that's all you can do, right? And uh, and 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 that's something I've always kind of taken with me. And um, so, yeah, it was just like a natural progression. And I've kind of been one of those people too that I, I kind of look at it like there was no backup plan. So I fully immersed myself. I'm a coach. This is what I do going to try to round myself out with experience, with knowledge, with, you know, knowledge in three sports and strength training, psychology. I think what a lot of triathlon coaches do, but, you know, the whole, whole mission for me was just uh, to be best I can and, and keep doing that. And, and uh, no looking back, just looking forward. It's funny. And you're very humble because by the way, Cliff was a very good junior cyclist, did the tour de Beauce. So like, to me. To, yeah, tour de B to B. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's pretty solid cyclist, but yeah, very humble, very humble guy and as a coach and as an athlete. Um, interested in in your path, uh, Craig. Where do where did you come from um, before coaching? It's not as different as Cliff he thinks. Actually, um, I raced. I got into it when I was seventeen, maybe sixteen, seventeen, uh, through cross country at school at high school. Some guys were doing it, and um, joined a swim club at seventeen, I think um and got destroyed for a few years <laughs> never really came around um but it was eye-opening and worked a part-time job to play pay for it um the funny thing cliffy when you talk about you know blue collar and uh well two things making i wrote down making mistakes um yeah we i think every coach has made every mistake in the book both as an athlete and as a coach so that resonated with me and um i was always uh a surprise through academics but with hand and and physiology, <laughs> a little of it made me a better coach, surprisingly. Looks great on a website or a CV, but it doesn't, it didn't really change things. So um, um, it's, it's nice to have that background, but it wasn't, it, it, I didn't think it was that formative. The, the big thing for me was um, uh, just kind of phasing out of racing. And I raced more at an age group level. I wasn't at, at Cliffs level and wasn't pro by any measure and wasn't well suited for draft legal. Um, and getting involved in starting a club at the university when I was at U of T. And then um, it was just people who opened doors. So I got to know Larry McMahon, who's Brent McMahon's dad. And um, it's still true today, but particularly back then, Triathlon Canada was a very volunteer-driven organization. And Larry was director of coaching and vice president of TriCan. And he was looking for people to help write policy and um evaluate coaches and there were internships available and I, you know, I met him that way and, and um, he really sort of shepherded me through that process. So I think I was the last of maybe five or six coaches that went through the NTC um, in an internship sort of position and going to the NCI. I think I'm the only one who didn't uh, graduate the NCI. Um, I'm still two, two modules short of my diploma from the NCI and I got hired back to Ontario before I finished, but um uh, it was it was really people making opportunities available to me, um, honestly, and then just you know getting your butt kicked all the time and trying to learn from your mistakes and and away you go. It's funny you should mention Craig because you know out of the three of us, you know obviously you're 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 the scholar, so you, master's degree, you understand <laughs> physiology, and we have this conversation, you know, off you know all the time about mm -hmm. the yeah. of, and you always come back to me and say yeah whatever, you know yeah mm -hmm. but but no and. I'm interested to know you both went through, you know, the, the, the national certification, you know, which is, I think it's a, it's a super program. I didn't have the opportunity mm -hmm. to do that. So it's, it's considered like the level four, if I'm not mistaken. And plus, yeah. Craig, you know, you went one step further, you went, you know, master's degrees. So I want to know when you say it's, a, there's an importance behind, you know, the, all the academics 
you know, it's the mm -hmm. base fundament. But like, I'm I'm curious to know what's your take on the importance of that versus the importance of on the field experience, because you both referred to that at different times. Cliff, do you, you want to you want me to start? I can start with that one. You got it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that it's it's an interesting balance, and I think that was the thing. My experience when I was younger, you know, meeting some people that had a master's in exercise physiology, but and I won't name names, but I just thought you know, pretty horrible coaches. Um, you know, they just kind of missed that application. And I don't like saying the art; like I think that's actually now been overused, and I kind of cringe when I hear that because it it really is overused term, but. For me, I was like the history, art history, you know, major in university. I love that side of it, the creativity. Um, so I think you, a lot of us have that basis. I mean, obviously, I don't have a master's in exercise physiology, but I understand it. But I think that what makes you a great coach um, is that ability, you know, the practical application, right? You have to have a good eye. You have to have a good understanding. But you have, you have to understand each athlete you coach better than they understand themselves. I've always kind of felt that like you always have to know, like I used to have an ability, especially like, you know, you have you hear people walk on the pool deck. I can tell when someone is tired by their footsteps. I can tell that when they're running, you know, I just really love that side of it just to get really deep into that aspect of, of everything coaching that you can't find in a textbook that you can't find in a classroom. And, you know, you, you just keep absorbing and learning, you know? And, and uh, so I think that that's how it always was a little bit for me. It just, I, a lot of things made sense, um, but the, it was that understanding of what's going on in your body and how you adapt, um, but from a very kind of practical standpoint. Um, yeah. It's funny you said that, Cliff, because I'm, I've always had was a very big difficulty with cyber coaching because, like, first of all, I don't like it. Like, quite honestly, what I like is being on deck. I appreciate yeah. those two. I, it's a privilege, those two, three, four hours that we have. And like you said, I, I always had a feeling that you're looking at – once you know an athlete, you look at them, and you, and then all of a sudden the plan is, you know, just, okay, we're going to have to adapt yeah. because whatever. But but there is an importance, and, and Craig, you can attest to that. There is an importance of having like a base, like a knowledge base on which it's kind of a foundation on which to build, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, what did grad school do for me? It was a good experience. UT is a good school. It was a, it was a good program oh, yeah. I was in. It was mainly a cardiac lab, but, you know, you took the, the all the courses. Um, it It... Probably, I probably came out being able to read research better, honestly, um, I, which you could achieve in an undergrad. I just wasn't, I didn't pay attention until third or fourth year. I sort of <laughs> goofed off in the first two years. So um, I, I could have done a much better job of that. I think probably the other thing it maybe gives me, and you don't need a, you don't need a master's to do this by any measure. Um, it, um, it, uh, it, it sort of gave me a slightly better BS detector. Um, and, uh, I was just having a, a talk with a coach that I'm uh, working with the other day. And, um, he was running some things by me that a, a very accomplished coach had said to him in terms of physiology, he said, are those things right? And I said, I try to say, no, they're not, I don't try to say they're wrong. I say, based on my understanding, I don't think that's correct. And it just gave this younger coach a bit more confidence. Like, okay, I, that coach is successful that I'm learning from, but his understanding of physiology is not so sharp and i i sort of could flag some things that were probably incorrect in this in the way he presented it so i, I think it it just gives you maybe a, a decent background but i mean a, you could have that background in psychology you could have that background in technical aspects um i remember long ago during my internship being in a, a, a planning meeting with the ntc coaches and, and joel filio was the the head coach of the center so it would have been like 06 07 sort of thing um and he made a very good argument that simon had more experience and expertise in triathlon than anybody sitting at that table that day um and he wasn't wrong so you know everybody's going to bring something different um the, the big differentiator for me it wasn't even the nci really i mean it was it was getting in the room with other coaches and learning from instructors but it was the mentorship and the day-to-day -day. i was on deck every day um well six days a week anyways and um I, I had two different lead coach mentors the, the two years I was there. Uh, I think Cliffy, you probably did your whole thing in a year, maybe. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, mine was mine was stretched out over two years because I came back to Ontario frequently. So um, I was I sort of did a part time over a longer time, and and um, 
it was really the experience of going to Worlds, being at World Cups, working under different coaches, having those conversations. Um, I think you can come from any background and, and, and excel as long as you're inquisitive and, and try to figure things out. I mean, there wasn't a grad class in reading power files or race tactics or, I mean, it was Lance Watson who explained to me what aerobic power training was, not, not, not grad school, I had an incorrect understanding of it. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's, just, it's just one pathway. And yeah. um, I think you can either use it as a foundation to be curious and be informed and, and sort of understand the basics and, and build on it, um, sort of have a model for inquiry and to learn, or I've seen other people use it as their calling card, um, mainly in an advertising way. And I always, I always look at those situations and I think, well, you know, science is one way of approaching coaching. Um, I wouldn't say, I just, I just look at the outcome, you know, the people that are the most, let's call them productive, maybe not best, but productive coaches currently or in the last 10 years in, in, in draft legal anyways, very few of them are physiologists. Um, they might have physiology support, but some of them really don't know anything about exercise physiology and they're, you know, they're producing champions consistently. So it, it's just a skill set, but it's not required for sure. So for you guys, how important in the equation in your development was the mentorship? <laughs> I'll, I'll, me? I'll go first, guys. I'll go first. Okay. Me, it was all. Like I've always said, full transparency, yeah. those first four years, Pierre Lafontaine, were the, you know, the foundation, you know, of the coach I became. Without those first four years, I wouldn't have ever had, you know, the opportunity to do what I had done or whatever. But it was, that was it. It I built from that moment on. So for you, because you, you mentioned Lance, which is another mm -hmm. like great Canadian coach. And mm -hmm. So how important is it, you know, for you guys? And would you think for a younger coach? You want to take I'll go team? first. Yeah, yeah. For, for me, it was number one. Um, I would say n number one, but I, I would blanket mentorship into like Larry McMahon, for example, mentored me along, but didn't, and he's a level three run coach, but he didn't, um, because of his positions in TriCan and, and, and uh, he didn't meddle in the day to day, let's call it. So he taught me different things that are unrelated to coaching. I've just had so many mentors. I've been, I've been lucky to have been exposed to a bunch of them. And um, a lot of them I had good relationships with, some I didn't um learn from both and sometimes you learn what you don't want to do and sometimes you have to admit that the person that you don't like you're actually learning decent things from um so in my best moments i'm able to sort of analyze you know whatever the experience has been and see if i can learn something from it um but it, it, under the broad umbrella of people making opportunities available and then the you know kind of the direct technical tactical uh, mentorship that you would get from senior coaches and then also just this a community of coaches that work together and share ideas. I would put all, all those guys in the same basket and women of mentorship because I learned something from every them, from all of them. I'd, I'd say that's number one. Yeah. Um, but it's not everybody's experience. Um, so I don't know what I don't know what Cliff will say on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you a lot there, Craig. I think you're constantly learning and, you know, you, you, you cross paths with people, you know, whether you're at a race and you're just having a good little discussion. I mean, for me, my early development years, you know, I went to a lot of world cups and world champs, that type of thing on my own, you know, so, you know, just paying to get there. And, and it was something that I felt I needed to do, you know, to get my athletes to the next level. And I always, you know, enjoyed, you know, grabbing a pint with the coach in, in a pub and learning and listening. And, um, you know, and I had some good coaches, you know, back in Quebec as well, you know, similar to what you were saying, you know, some good, some bad, you know, you, you learn, I was someone that I learned a lot from a lot of people and I had some, you know, friends in Montreal, you know, guys like Andrew Martin, you know, who went pretty far and, and, uh, some other guys. So mm -hmm. it's quite fortunate to kind of see that growth. So I, I, like I said, I've always been really good at observing and just being a sponge and taking stuff in and. But I've always, it's interesting because even when I was really young, I um, kind of developed this, <laughs> it might be a little arrogant, I suppose, and when you think about it, but my little theory about being your own hero, it was something I always kind of stuck with me yeah. whenever, you know, I was 16, 17, you know, on a bike, I always had a bird's eye, I was very good at visualization, and I can always look down and 
I just absolutely loved to suffer. I always felt uh, I was racing Greg LeMond. It was a climb to get to my parents' house out in Mont saint solaire and it's about two miles long. And I just annihilate myself every single time. I'm like, well, that's not good enough. Greg, Greg would attack me again. I have to attack harder. Got to go again. Got to go again. And I just would do that. And I loved, for me, that was like a, a powerful image of seeing me suffer. And it was something that always gave me a lot of uh, confidence for whatever reason. And and I kind of always took that with my coaching, um, you know, my development. Um, you know, I always kind of felt I wanted to develop my own style from a very early age, um, you know, and it was something that it was more organic because I was kind of just very stubborn. So I just really wanted to figure it out for myself. So I'd hear some people and I'm like, ah, I could do better than that, you know, and it was always one of those like it kind of fueled me um you know i i i definitely but i i think it's really important um i think sometimes it's really nice that when you do have a good friend someone that you're competitive with like alex was like that for me like in our earlier years we would still talk openly it wasn't like we wanted to hide anything you know like oh we're doing this or like oh you know just like lying about someone going to a race which you know some coaches do and stuff and it's like you know <laughs> You know, it was always fun because you want to do battle. You got to do that. And then you go back to the to the drawing board, you know, and actually kind of to round back to one thing you were saying as well, Craig, like I didn't have the opportunity, you know, to to, to do sports science, um, you know, when I was in university. And, and what's been pretty cool is when I've been coaching, I've had that opportunity. And it's something that I, I've really enjoyed. You know, obviously, when I went to the NCI in Canada, got that opportunity to, you know, do more testing. Um, I worked for a good coach, Paulo, Paulo Saldana, um, in the mm -hmm. 90s. You know, that's he he coached me for a bit. And, you know, we had uh, or he had, you know, his Compu Trainer studio back, you know, in 90, 95, 96. And I worked with him. So, I, you know, at that age, I already learned you were doing like lactate testing every single day. And so that was a lot of fun to me. And then when I was a U.S. coach, you know, the lab access we had was incredible. And I just always love, you know, getting in there. And even now, you know, we work very closely with our kinesiology department. And it's probably one of the, if I, you know, I, I just don't have the time. If I said, if I had a regret, I'd love to go back to do that. Like, I love being in the lab. It's really fun. The data is really cool to me, but how, how it pertains to what we're doing, right? That's the aspect uh, I love yeah, most, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, but I, you know, there's definitely been people over, over the years and, and good friends and coaches that um, I feel like just having that sounding board and, and, and being able to throw ideas back and forth has been really good. Um, but like I said, a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, my development, I guess, of just being pretty hard headed and just really believing that, I, you know, I, I, I know what I'm doing with that. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's funny that totally. you mentioned that, Cliff, because one of the things I remember being a young coach and and one of the things Pierre used to do a lot is expose me to like more senior coaches and like people that are, you know, really been in the game for a long time. And I was always like, didn't understand what they're doing because I'm like in the book, it doesn't say that you do that. And they're like, yeah, yeah. I've been doing it for 25 years. It works super well. And I'm like, like I, and now like I'm 50 years old. Yeah. I, I can see myself writing the workout and going, well, uh, okay, well, I know why. I know why it works. I've, you know, I've tested it. It works. Yeah. But if you were to ask me, I'd be like, uh, you know, I, I, you probably wouldn't like my response, my answer. <laughs> it's hard. Like you said, it does sound kind of like for me, like I, I'm, I'm not arrogant, but I'm just – I'm like, people are like, oh, well, that's the way you do it because it's in this book. And I was like, and even people ask me to this day, like, what books, you know, what should I read? And I'm like, man, like, I, I, I didn't read any. Like, I just I just figured it out, you know, but you're always figuring it out. I think the biggest thing I always say to coaches is coach hundreds of athletes. The more athletes you're exposed to, the more you learn <laughs> over and over every. I mean, I still take amateurs. I still take, you know injured broken athletes like i think it, it i really truly believe it makes you better like i love you know sometimes you beat your match and you're like oh okay i really took something on and then wow i gotta see you know this is gonna challenge me to to the to the depths of what what i'm made of but i love that you need that like that's how you challenge yourself you can be like okay here's a book i read it great but at the same time you can't take that book and, and apply it to every instance and and i think that's the coolest thing for me it's the problem solving element of coaching like i've always I love games. I love chess. I love all that element of stuff. That's what the coaching is to me. You know, it's like whether you take it to tactics or 
I mean, breaking it down is one of, you know, whether it's ITU or even Iron Man. I mean, I, I love that side of it, you know, and it's really cool too when you have athletes that will tell you, like, even Iron Man athletes are like, wow, everything you said happened. Everything you said people would do in their tendencies. Like, I love doing the homework on people, going like, okay, this person's going to push it up, Javi. This person's going to do this, you know, and like, you got to be ready for that and like every aspect of it. And then, even, you know, for, you know, people that have coached that, you know, maybe are not front pack swimmers. I'm like, be patient. You'll see, you know, by the end, you know, 85 miles, you'll crack the top 12. By this time, you'll get off here. You'll run into this at this time. And they're like, it, it worked. <laughs> but like, it's it's knowing it, right? Like, I think that's the thing. And knowing all the possible things that can happen. That's what I like, you know, like being really prepared. And and uh, so I'm, I'm still a huge fan of sport. Like, that's, I think, my biggest thing. Like, I'm reading one of Pep Guardiola's books right now. Like I'm a huge fan of of soccer and uh, Pep is a Spanish coach. And I think he's, he's absolutely brilliant. He's actually born two days be before me and we're the same age. <laughs> it's maybe my current crush, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's just some brilliant people in so many different sports out there just have an incredible understanding of their craft. But I think all of this we can take and draw upon and apply to what we do. And so I kind of, you know, even when we first had COVID, I was watching, you know, Premier League soccer a lot. And and there were some really interesting things. Like even you had Liverpool that were the current champions. And then they went into, you know, the COVID year and you got Jurgen Klopp, who's like another, you know, like this absolute amazing coach, you know, kind of saying, oh, you know, like we're really missing having the crowds. And you're like, well, there's 20 other teams that don't have crowds. Like no one has an advantage here. Like <laughs> you need to get your guys motivated. And, you know, if you're, I mean, some of these guys are making 800,000 pounds a week. And like, if that's not motivating to get out of the bed, I don't know what is. Right. So there's a lot of things like that. I just find very interesting. And, you know, you're, you're yeah. So I don't know. I'm constantly learning, looking at different sports and, and that as well. I, th I think you'll agree to that, Craig. We're, at, at yeah. some point you become a student of the sport, you know, and that's, and you have that. I've always been a fan of, especially sports. I, I don't understand like any, mm -hmm. you know, any sports that's a, a team sport, I don't get. And, no. and that's where my interest is like any s cycling running I get. And then I watch soccer and I'm like, I don't get it. I'm like, <laughs> and it's such a tactical sport and it's, it's so many components. And I'm like, I, I just don't get it. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's, so it's like, you know, and I, I guess you, you have that interest too, right, Craig? Yeah. So I, if I, if mentorship's my number one, you know, what's on the list of development, number two would be sort of reflection and, and having drive, which is just what Cliffy talked about, right? Like thinking about what you did, how it worked, what you're missing, what your gaps are. I, you know, I, I like lists and checklists and stuff. So I would just sit down in the fall and go every year, write down, where my gaps were, it's not a gap analysis so much. It's like, it's like things I'd like to be better at basically, which is a gap, I guess. And um, and also just evaluating your work on a day-to-day -day -day or weekly basis. There weren't many weeks I was really thrilled with the program I wrote. Um, I could, you know, <laughs> that's a B plus week, that's a C minus, that's, you know, whatever. I could always, always thought I could do better and be more prepared. Um, so if you've got that drive and, and you're willing to evaluate yourself, um, I, you know, to me, that's number two on the list. Um, you need to reflect on your experiences and, and what you've learned and what, you, what you're going to, what you're going to take from those, what you're going to keep, what you're going to throw away, what you're going to change um, and, uh, and what you can still learn. We, I was talking to Greg Keeley today. He's our current Ontario provincial coach and he and I coached a, a lot together about 10 years ago now, um, 12 years ago now, it's been a while, but we did one, um, uh, like a young guns tour in, Europe one summer, I think it was 2010 or 2011, and we were sort of tasked with taking a, a uh, it was only young guys, I think, um, Yorkie was one of them, he was a U23, and Jeff Phillips and Andrew McCartney and, and guys like that, to go over and experience basically continental cup racing in Europe, and um, and also to see if actually Banff France was a good place to stage for London Games, so just scout that. And um, Anyways, uh, the Australian team was in was in acts, and um, it was all their coaches. And uh, I think our first or second day on the pool deck, they came over and spoke with us about the recent changes to the IT rules, and there's an ITU Congress, and 
how the rules would affect things. And we sort of nodded and we turned to Greg after they went off deck. And I said, did you know any of that? I don't know a thing about that. So we ran home to the hotel and went through the entire rule book again and, and learned it. That's not quite, you know, reflection. That's more getting your butt kicked, but um, you know, those experiences do expose you. And, and, and we still joke. That was one joke about the, the fact that we probably learned more in those two weeks um, about a whole host of things related to coaching than we did any other time. So you don't, you don't need mentors. Sometimes you just need a, you know, a partner in crime or, or a good, uh, a good harsh evaluation of yourself. You well, can never let them know, though, right? <laughs> oh, I never, I never told the Aussie coaches. God, no, no, yeah. no. Um, I think it's the biggest yeah. thing. When you're like, damn, that's a really good idea. I can't believe I didn't come up with that, but it doesn't happen. I, I, so I, I will, I will say, if I, if I like a set or an idea from somebody, I would always put it in our schedule and call it the so and so set. So if I sold one of your sets, Cliff, it'd be the Cliff Ingo set, or you know, I, when I. Early in coaching, I used to assistant coach for Kevin McKinnon, who's a really well-known coach here in Ontario and, and runs um, uh, Triathlon Magazine Canada. And so there'd be the McKinnon set. Or Will Clark was a British ITU athlete who had a swim set I liked, so we call it the Will Clark set. Nobody else in the world calls that the Will Clark set. I think it's an Australian swim set. But So I would always label, put names on them. It's just like the, you know, the Montegetti run set and stuff like that. So I, yeah. would, I, would, um, I would attribute, as I stole, <laughs> um, but if there was like proprietary knowledge, I felt I should have known <laughs> that I wouldn't admit to anybody. I didn't know it. I'd go learn it from somebody or, or figure it out myself and then, and then come back and just try to get better. It's, it's funny you guys mentioned because, and then Cliff can attest to this cause he just came back from Florida, but. Oh, I shouldn't. Yeah. Sorry, Alex, I'll interrupt you. We did have a Sereno set as well. For, yeah, I yeah, I mentioned that. yeah. Yeah. You know, we did. I stole <laughs> one of your sets too. I know because the kids would then tell me, I was like, oh, we did, we did a set. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> One of the cool things, guys, is that the triathlon, the sport of triathlon, it's such a surprising, like unknown, eventful sport. Like I come from mm-hmm. swimming. So, it, you know, the pool doesn't all of a sudden become, the, you know, it's it's the pool and it's closed. It is, you know, triathlon. And Cliff, you just came back from Florida. Race is canceled. Race is back up. It's got wind. It's got, you know, it's got wetsuit. doesn't have wetsuit. You know, and and that for me, I love triathlon because of that. That's one of the components that I. But from a learning standpoint, it's rich, right? Oh yeah, I mean, that's the hardest thing. Like when you are coaching a younger athlete, you know, a newer athlete, and they're they, you know, they're doing a sport to try. They know, but then you can still kind of see like things change. It gets delayed, and you start seeing that look in their face, and you're like, "Oh shit! All right, here we go." You know, I got to really coach this kid. You know, and because I the very like the, the variables are 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 many, and and that's one of the things I love the most. I mean, I think unfortunately, I probably would have had a much better career in sport if everything was bad all the time. Because when it was raining and shit and wet. I was the best on the bike. Like, I love that stuff. If you made it nasty, anyone's fears, anything, I was my playground. I was like the boogeyman of endurance sports. I'm like, oh, I love that, you know? And yeah, I needed more of that. I needed snow every day we're on a bike. <laughs> but it's interesting because <laughs> when you know that and then you see your athletes, that was always my biggest thing. I think when I first made that full transition to coaching, I still had that ability to kind of read someone, kind of know if they were a threat or not, like as an athlete. And you can kind of feel always got a sense from someone. And then if you got that in an athlete, you're like, oh man, I got like 24 hours to turn this around because this kid is not confident right now, you know? And like, you can feel like, oh, they're about to, um, they're about to fold. Um, we won't name any names either, but Alex knows a few I know. <laughs> and you're, oh, what am I going to do? We got to get this guy, get him, get him up, get him ready. But uh, yeah, but those are the cool things, you know, when you recognize that, then it gives you more stuff to work on. And I think that's, one of the cool things about our sport, you know, there is so much to work on, you know, not, no, not, not only the actual three sports in itself, but that huge amount of psychology, you know, whether you're dealing a hot weather, hilly, wetsuit swim, non-wetsuit swim, there's just so much. And it just, if you're very thorough and you like the details, I think, you know, for all three of us, you know, here, that's one thing that I think we'd really agree on. Like, it just gives you such a plethora of things to think about all the time. But if it makes sense to you, you know, I think that was when I remember when I first came to the U.S. and there was a, you know, like a U23 junior coach. And it was interesting because I'm really big believer in periodization for everything. Um, I was like, oh, no, you got to tell him this, got to tell him that. I'm like, 
did you notice after six minutes the look in the face of the person you're talking to they were checked out they're not even paying they're like looking like they have no idea what's going on now like you gave them too much like it's good yeah. stuff like it's really good but you've got to kind of like feed it in at the right moments find your timing you know maybe this situation arises now there's your moment right and like those are the things that i really like you're thinking about each year helping your athlete acquire that knowledge that skill set um and these tools that they're going to take further on but I, I think a lot of coaches don't understand that delivery you could really you know rush it you know we see the same thing with development you know development is rushed in many 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 ways and many times but i also think the information you give in in, in that skill set even though you know it would be beneficial they're just not ready for it at times I, I have a question, guys. Actually, I don't have a question, but I'll put it here. George has a question. Um, in your opinion, what would be the percentage of work compared to genes and compared to coaching to produce an Olympian? That's, that's, that's a good. tough one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I could give – you know what we, we want to do? You want to tag team it there, Craig? I can yeah. give my, my non-scientific, and then you can validate oh, it. Come on. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I forgot my white coat tonight. <laughs> well, just if I may, there yep. is a, a, a like a, a percentage of talent. So like Gene and uh, obviously yep. at that yep. level, yep. you know, that's we'll all agree to that. Yep. So starting from that, then we move on to the hard, you know, the hard stuff, which is yeah. it can't it's just perfect. be talent. Yeah. I mean, honestly, to come up with, uh, I mean, that that's where, Craig, you might, you know, an, an actual percent. I mean, you got to have the genes. It's a big part of it. But we've all in our lifetime, I'm sure, have seen people on paper that you'd be like, oh, my God, they they got it. But unfortunately, what was going on upstairs, you know, the mm -hmm. the mental component, being able to deal with the stress like I always everyone wants to win. I always find that really interesting when you're kind of developing athletes and, you know, and and, and I think that's one of the biggest things, too. Then when you've done it, you have that experience. You know, it's the same thing as an athlete, like when you're a Simon Whitfield or these, you know, kind of people or, you know, that, that know they've done it. They have that confidence when you've done it as a coach, you have that confidence as well that you've done it. And, and it's not always the same mold, not always the same athlete, but some of the common denominators that need to really happen. This person has to be tough. They have to be mentally tough. They have to be resilient. They have to almost be stubborn. Like if you say, Hey, you're never going to make it. I need you to go away. And they're like, Oh, okay. And they go away. Not that you would ever say that, you know, this is here, you yeah. know, I, I've always been a nurturer as a coach, to be honest. Um, and I like nurturing people, but <laughs> it's one of those things that person's not going to go. They're going to come back like, coach, no, 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 I'm going back in. I'm going to do more, you know, that kind of thing. They also have to be coachable. I think that's the biggest thing because doing more, as we also know, isn't always best either. There's a lot of athletes mm -hmm. that go down that path. They got to be able to take a little instruction, understand and and relinquish i always say it's like the reins on a horse be like hey you order the keys to a car be like hey coach you got the keys whatever you think you know and obviously there is i think that unit of the athlete coach is amazing and that together it, when you are together is one of the most beautiful things i mean i think that's what we love about the coaching when you really have that and it works well with an athlete no one's offended you could be brutally honest and that's how you get there so it takes all those things kind of working together but yeah, I mean, when you look at all the best people and you work your way back, they they have all that. But, you know, what does Alistair have? What does Christian have? It's like there's those other little things. You know, there's a lot of people that test well in the lab. Not everyone has that ability to go the well like that, like, and just, like, and pass out. You know, I mean, you yeah. need to have that. And you got to think. I mean, you have to have all of that. You got to be a good problem solver, handle the pressure, all of that. Craig? Yeah, that's that's totally right. I, I would say if you're looking at genetics and v, let's say VO2, um, like your exercise capacity, however you want to frame that, you need to have a ticket to the dance. Um, but it's just getting over a line, and then everybody you're racing against is somewhere in that cohort. So there there are no there's no men with a VO2 of 50 at the Olympic Games in the sport of triathlon. Um, but the winner might not have 88. The winner might have 78. Well, 78 getting a little low, but you'd be somewhere in there. Um, you know, there's, there's a myriad of um, things that matter. I've, I've seen lots of athletes have different skill sets. Um, some are quite trainable and they can really increase their fitness over their career. Uh, one of the superpowers I've seen in some athletes is just resiliency, like physical resiliency of their, they don't get injured very much. 
um, either because of their habits and the way they're coached or just, you know, just their, the way their body's built and what they can handle um, or maturity over time. So, you know, genetics shows up in a bunch of ways, um, fiber type, a feel for the water. You can have two athletes with a massive VO2, same number, and one can swim and one can't, right? Um, so it's part of the thing. Um, and uh, what's the saying that uh, uh, talent, uh, something about talent, talent, beats hard work until until hard uh, hard work and talent come together or something i've just butchered it but basically you can get, only get so far in talent when hard work and talent come together you'll win um i was just making some notes on on what cliffy was saying and and the athletes that i worked with that had the best shot or ultimately got selected or or I'm, i kind of feel will get selected for the next one let's say or the one after that like there's some younger athletes i've worked with recently that i i really think have a great shot um they had a good sense of self and commitment and they're committed to the journey and they um they don't expect a guarantee um they know it's going to be hard but they maybe don't know how hard it's going to be but that's okay but the, the big thing is when they're in workout and they get their butt kicked they're they're either level or they're thankful they're not um they're you, you know they're they're not they don't lose confidence their ego's not damaged by it they're, for them, it's a confirmation they're actually in an environment that can push them, and that's good. Um, so I, I definitely have seen that, and and you know, most of the athletes, not all of them, but a lot of them have sort of an in, and Cliffy, maybe you feel differently on this one. They have an innate ability to deliver on the bigger days. That um, I've just seen some athletes that I was more of a nervous, anxious athlete, um, so I would get flat on the bigger days sometimes, and this is like. You know, national level age group racing this isn't elite racing but there's there are some inherent characteristics of the athletes who tend to make it they 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 can deliver when their back's against the wall um but mainly it's the day-to-day -day. it's the commitment they all have that it's, it, they're highly organized they're pretty resilient they, they've got the genetics but it's it's the ability to it's just the self-confidence to go in tired and get your ass kicked on a given day and go okay <laughs> i might need a rest day but I'm not a garbage athlete. And I found more than anything, that's what kept them going year over year. And it also helped them in races. I, I didn't do great today, but I'll, I know what I need to work on, I'll get better. Um, it was that mindset. So if you've got all those other pieces, it really is your your mindset under load, under pressure, under fatigue, that you just don't doubt yourself very much. Funny thing, I, I've just had, you know, two Olympians in, on my CV, but, you know, Funny thing is, I've coached so many hundreds of athletes. Not a lot of them have come to me and like said, like to my face, "I'm gonna go to the Olympics." And a lot, you know, obviously, you know, you're 13, you're 14. I want to go to the Olympics. That's one thing. But you know, past that maturity state, I'm 19 years old, and I come to the coach and I say, you know, it's like this is where I'm going, and they voice it, and then they work their way towards the journey, you know, and like. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of them, like, happened to me like two, three times. That's it. And I can, it, it always surprised me because when you hear it and you see it and you look at the eyes and you're like, okay. Obviously, they know they've got the baggage, the skill set, but they seem to know that they also know they're going to be what's expected. That it's going to be hard. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be. But that always surprised me so much. And somehow it, it did happen. So I guess, you know, it's, but that's something to, to be that age, like early adulthood and actually say that out loud. And just once you've said it, you're like, all right, got to do it. You know, <laughs> I remember with, with Sam, my first Olympic athlete in 2004, one of the bigger impactful things for her was uh something she had read in mark tewksbury book you know and it was the one like why not yeah. me right it was like that big kind of resounding you know we also used a lot of that that um mindset that i had spoken earlier about be your own hero as well and that was one of the things like when sam did that and how she did it and what she had to do on the day to do that she was like you know it was interesting after she made that it was it was one of those moments that kind of gives you chills as a coach because then now we made the team and she's training and she's like, you know, I used to always go and pull upon, you know, my image of, you know, Simon Whitfield in the finish shoot of Sydney, 
she's like, when I went to go there, when I was really hurting on the run, I actually saw me. And that's like the thing where you make that full circle. And I think it's so, so huge when you're like, now you are actually taking inspiration from what you did, you know, and I've always said that I think every athlete, whether it's, you know, amateur or professional has that ability to do something heroic, you know, I mean, that's, that's what I think we strive for. And, you know, and like you were saying, Craig, you know, being able to do it on the big day. Um, I think, you know, when we see the different generations, we, we, there are some challenges out there with our, with, you know, younger generations now. And, you know, but I've, I've even had it with athletes, you know, 10 years ago where it's been a good trajectory, you know, they're kind of going, 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 going. And you're like, mm -hmm. we need to have a loss. We need to have some hardship. We got to have some adversity because it's too easy right now. I want to see how they are under pressure. You know, you need to almost kind of create those situations sometimes too but at the same time you know life creates them for you and um but those are the big ones you know and and uh you know i've had athletes um it's funny even you know top 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 iron man you know that you know going like well what if i'm 10 minutes back out of the swim and you know like yeah you better bike and run that's it <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what can you say? Right. You know, you're like, and that's about where, you know, this athlete was going to come out, you know, and that's fine. Like, like, I think that's the biggest thing when I always work with an athlete. I'm like, it's going to be about reality. You know, I'm like, this is where you're at. This is where they're at. This is what we're going to have to do. You know, you, I think so many people kind of, I mean, it's interesting. Maybe not so many, but I think some coaches do a disservice and they set their athletes up. You know, they're always talk a lot about like, oh, you're, you know, you're going to be an Olympic medalist. You're going to be a you know, world champion. And, I mean, we've, you know, it's interesting out there. There's, you know, it's sometimes I always am very intrigued when I do interviews with an athlete, you know, like a big name person wants to work with you. And then they tell you that they're talking to someone else. And I'm like, well, what'd they say? You know, cause I'm telling you here, cause I like to aim low and build, you know, where mm -hmm. other people, oh, and they said they're at, you know, I'm like, wow, that's cool. You know, you've got the potential to do it. Absolutely. But it's not handed to you. We got to get there, and it hasn't happened yet. So we need to. You know, I haven't worked with you yet either. So what is the limiter? You know, is it stress, pressure, mental? Like, what are we looking at, right? And like, until I see you race and I take, you know, the keys to the car and work with you, don't know everything. You know, you can definitely sit in the sidelines or ask questions or speculate as to what people are doing or what the issues or what the limiters are. Huh? Yeah. So. It's a good segue yeah. to this one. You know, what do you guys rely on or to, you know, monitor, measure fatigue? And that's one component, but what do you yeah. guys do? I mean, honestly, for me, it's the feedback. It's, it's, it's got to be very, I mean, you could have it on training peaks. You can have a pie graph that maps everything if you want, if that's, you know, how, how, how you see things. And that was like, you know, I think, Alex, you said something much earlier in, in, in the show what when I went into doing a little more online, like remote coaching, I was definitely very against it in the beginning because I was like, oh, you know, I'm a hands on coach this is what I do. And then, you know, you start getting athletes want to work with you from other parts of the world. And you're like, well, that's a cool athlete. I'd like to do that. You know, why would I limit myself? I took everything I knew as a hands on coach. I'm like, what do I need? What do I need to hear? I want to need, you know, how is your sleep? How's the body feeling? Did you wake up sore? You you know, like all these little, 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 like the very basic, like you can definitely, you know, monitor a whole heap of other things. But for me, you know, if you're starting to see some interesting heart rate variability or different things, you're like, okay, you know, let's back off a little or, but for me, it really is a communication. I've coached athletes, um, you know, like Ash, Ashley Gentle was one of my, you know, athletes that I took over, I think at the 2013 and it was all remote. You know, until there was times I saw her, but most of it was daily communication, constant communication about and and every every aspect of every workout was like, you know, you you have to analyze. You're like, okay, cool, that was really good, or you know, you finished really strong, or you faded. What's going on? How do you, you know, all those little things. There's so many questions, but once you get to that place and you're getting that information, you're not flying blind, right? So that's the most important thing. And for me, it's more like I like the basic stuff, just a, a finger on the pulse. I'm curious because Craig's a he's the science guy here in the group, so I'm curious, you know, to have your your take on that. <laughs> it's sure. been it's been 20 years since I graduated from from UT, um, and uh, a lot of what I thought I knew then is now wrong. Um, <laughs> so uh, I I I've tried a bunch. Um, my preference was to be a hands-on coach too. I felt I was 
a pretty bad online coach. Um, I likened it to trying to play piano with oven mitts on. Like I just had no feel for it. Um, and even the in-person athletes that I work with, if I was on a camp and was writing for the kids back home, I was bad at that. Um, so I, I do plan stuff out and write it, but it's just being there is so much diff more different for me. And I don't, honestly, compared to you two, I don't feel nearly as intuitive about how an athlete looks or sounds. I, I need to spend a lot of time with them, like months and years to get a feel for them. I'm, I just, I, it's, it's one of the skills I've just never really felt I had as a coach to really read somebody in a hurry. Um, so my, my go-to was always to try to, everybody does this anyways, but try to teach the kids how to read themselves and, and work with me on it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go through a list if it helps. Um, we've done um, resting heart rate and sleep regularly. Um, we've done something called a rescue seven, which is just, uh, it's just I think we use seven. The, the big rescue is like 60 questions, whatever. We use seven validated, uh, I think on a weekly basis. And it's, you know, how satisfied are you with um, your nutrition, your training, how confident are you, how well do you sleep, all the, and charted that over time. Um, uh, we've done, we did regularly do quarterly bloods. Um, we did a blood draw for most athletes, uh, quarterly to stretch. We probably did it three times a year on average by the time somebody's missed something for an exam or whatever. I did find those helpful. Um, and, uh, but the other stuff uh, we've done O2 saturation when we're at altitude, we, um, I'm trying to think of the other stuff we've tried at the end of the day, what we learned is that there's actually, uh, it, it, there was different metrics for different athletes. So I can think of one athlete um, that I had good success with turning around and um, recovery was an issue for this athlete. And we just plotted their sleep and realized that when it was below, I think it was eight and a half hours, they had some bad days. So we just drew a line across eight and a half hours and said, that's your goal. We didn't measure anything else other than blood. Um, we did catch an athlete once with low ferritin before it became a problem, because that can be a leading indicator before you develop um, hemoglobin problems and red blood cell problems and change the iron supplementation. And they went on to do really well in the back end of the season. So once in a while, like um, that can work, but it's finding something, it, it, in my opinion, it's finding something that's um, fairly quick, fairly easy and sensitive to what the, how the athlete responds. Um, so for a lot of athletes, it is just, the amount of sleep uh, or it's a score and how they're feeling. I, I've never had a lot of luck with resting heart rate, or sorry, um, uh, heart, uh, heart rate variability, sorry. Um, we even tried check swims or check runs or 30 minute bikes at zone one power and looking at the heart rate response, submaximal heart rate stuff. And it, it was, there was so much noise in the system from, you know, caffeine or diet or heat, if it was indoor, outdoor, that I didn't, I didn't find them very sensitive, honestly. Um, so, you know, the, the hunt continues. There's no, there's no one marker that ever worked for us really. No, or no <laughs> gadget that's going to help you with all that. That's the biggest thing, you know? And, no, you know. but I, I tried, uh, and I don't know how successful I was, but I tried to introduce these things and work through them without overloading the kids with too many things. We didn't do them all at once because you can just burn them out. Um, but with the sense that we're going to try this and then we're going to evaluate it. And if we don't like it, it's gone. And if we do like it, we'll keep it. And it might be that you two over there, keep it. And you nine over here don't. Um, but it was just, I was trying to develop for myself, but also for the kids, the toolkit that they could either use in our squad or move on somewhere else and take with them information, skills, mindset that, that they could continue to grow as an athlete. So recovery was part of it. We just never found, you know, the Holy grail on that really. That's a big one, though, Craig, like I agree, like a lot of times, I think all of us when we started, you know, we didn't, weren't able to travel to every race with an athlete. So it's mm -hmm. about getting that self sufficiency, giving them the skills, giving them the knowledge to, to be able to make those calls, like one of my biggest, you know, very simple principles leading into a race is don't force it, see what your body has is let it come, right? All these like, mm -hmm. very, very basic things, but you do have to teach your athlete to have that, you know, and um, and it's, you know, you get a lot of, once they also recognize it and it, it's one of those things when they'll be like, oh, you know, I was like with a bunch of other athletes and then they were running way too quick. I backed off. You're like, well done, bravo. You know, like that's the yeah. way it should be, yeah. you know, you're not getting pulled into that. And, um, yeah, you know, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's the thing, you know, you really want to give them those tools, you know, for life, whether they're with you or they move on to another coach, but they actually know what they're looking for. And, 
um, yeah, I think that's super, super key. Yeah, I think I think my three goals were um, for anybody who came into the squad was um, you need to come in to make us better. Um, you know, bring more than you take, and I'll I'll try to do the same. Um, the second would be we're going to try to make you a better athlete. So you can take that toolbox of skills either to another squad. Uh, you know, if we're no longer compelling and interesting for you to be here, and that does happen, people need to move on sometimes. Or you take it into business or a degree or whatever. Um, and, uh, the third thing was, we're going to try to get you as close to your potential as possible. And I don't know where your potential is, but it's, it's way up there somewhere. So there's lots of room and everybody's potential is different. Um, and it, I, you know, I, I finally got to the point where the place where if we could do those three things, if an athlete could be able to bring more to the squad than they took, that they were building skills across the board and in, in lots of different ways, mechanical, psychological, um, obviously tactical, technical, um, and then that, and um, uh, and then they would get closer to the potential, and we were that was our metric for doing a good job. And I sort of got rid of the other, the other end of season metrics on how did your squad do and all that stuff. Um, you you both are amazing high performance coaches, but fundamentally, one the one of the things I've always said about you two guys, and I'd like to be part of that trio, is that I think we're pretty good development coaches and because we 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 see the long game i think you know and so and that comes with time obviously you come you build you build the patience you've been around a few times so you know the road the road is long but i want to hear you guys on the importance of you know setting the right foundation you know whether you have the ability to move to international level or not how, how important it is for you guys as coaches? I mean, I think it's pretty important. I, I think one of the biggest things we see more of a challenge nowadays, to be honest, is, is um, you know, there was a time where an athlete would stay with you eight to 10 years, you know, and I'm a big believer in the amount of time that it takes to develop someone to a world-class level. Um, and I, that might be a difference as well in philosophies. Like I've met people and I've known, you know, obviously when I moved over to Victoria, you know, they, it was very much like, oh, your development and then you're this, where I always saw myself as all the way coach. <laughs> um, and like I said, that was just something I'm like, I want to coach someone all the way. Um, I feel I have the skill set to do that um, versus like, hey, this is where I go and then I'm going to hand off, you know, and, and in a perfect world, that'd be really cool. You know, if you have someone that really does a great job developing and getting that foundation and, and you know, some of the stuff both of you guys have said, you know, whether it's psycho the psych psychological, um, the technical, the tactical, just really getting to a good level of, of a good competency, then they can move on. That would be fantastic. But I, I think now, you know, it, it is interesting, you know, two to four years, you do see these switches with, you know, oh, you know, it's not going as well. I think a plateau, I'm going to go try this. And there's been so much i know it's kind of like my little theme these days you know with social media it's it's really changed the sport in my opinion you know i used to go to world champs or you go to hawaiian iron man and no one's taking a photo of like look check my bike in you know all that they were just like focused on the race um so it's very different and i think there's a lot more noise that we have to deal with and a lot more athletes are influenced by what they're seeing their peers or other people doing or other professionals or you know hey wow look at this squad like you know and, and and it's really, it's a challenge because, you know, we all know, you know, there's like, there's really a lot of good with social media, but there's also a lot like no one's putting, you know, the bad. They're like, oh, look at this. This is great. You know, so you want to go and train with this group. We want to train with this group. So I think there's always a lot of challenges there to people want it yesterday too. Right. But it, that hasn't changed. I think that's one of the biggest characteristics of, of a champion is they have the drive and they want it and they want it badly and they're impatient the coach is the one that has the patience and we know the path, but it's like finding that happy medium where you come together and you're like, Hey, look, we we're going to take a long drive here. It's going to be about eight years. You got to be with me. And this is how we get there. You know, and we're going to have some good stuff along the way, some good blips that show we're doing what we're doing and, and, and we're on the right path. But um, it is interesting because there's a lot of young athletes out there that, you know, I already think they know it. Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I don't need a coach or I just need, you know, someone every once in a while. And you're like, oh, but I'm injured again. <laughs> and it's just like, I think that, that that kind of aspect of experience is is a little lost. A lot of people don't understand 
that when you have a coach that has 20, 25, 30 years, that's a big library. And that's something we're always able to draw upon, you know, and, and uh, why wouldn't you want to have that in your corner? I'm I'm a big fan of and where you're at right now the NCAA circuit because it kind of builds you you have to go through school and you know development years and it's four years yeah it is what it is and because we're a late you know a mature a late mature sport it's perfect because after that worst case scenario you've got a degree and you've had yeah. a really good a good time for four years so. You know, you get after that. So, so that system seems to be, if it fits a lot of sports like triathlon, and I think you'll agree with me, Craig. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, we we did go through a phase when the Brownleys were young and killing everybody. That that the sense was the sport was getting younger, and maybe school was not it was better put off for athletes. I didn't hold that opinion, but that was sort of the dominant opinion of some some communities I was working with. Um, my opinion is, has been and remains that if you um, do university over four or five years, that puts a slight damper on the loads you can do. Um, and it probably, uh, it's obviously better for your education, your career prospects and all those things. But in terms of load and training um, and just life experience, it is a great time to develop and it sort of puts a cap on things as opposed to, you know, spending, uh, chasing the sun the entire year in a suitcase and, and not getting your degree. Um, uh, and that said, I've seen athletes go back after their careers and get their degree, but still think they would have been better suited um, getting it when they were younger. I think it's you incredibly know. age appropriate for development as well. Like even my first Olympic athlete, we, yeah. you know, she was full time in school. McGill graduated 2002. It's a perfect amount of time to get on the circuit, go full time. It holds you back. And, and, and like you said, I mean, we've had so everything repeats itself. We had the same thing even 10 years prior to the emergence of the Brownleys where people were recommending not going on their university. You got to go now. You got to do what you're young. And it's uh, I think it's great. It's certainly the most rewarding coaching I feel I've ever done in my career, you know, to have that balance. It's very holistic. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm competitive. The girls are competitive. We've had the highest GPA since we started. So I keep like fueling that. I'm like, Tennis is close, oh. golf is close, but the girls like are like, oh, what? how close? I'm like, you know, and then the A pluses come, you know. So it's it's it's, but it's pretty amazing, and I agree. Like, that's what's yeah. so cool about this. Even you know, back in the day when I was the U.S. coach, we were like, man, like imagine one day if we actually had the NCA and we're an NCA sport instead of losing athletes, you know, to running or swimming, we actually have them in our sport. And if you can get them to a good program with a good coach, they can continue that development with the right amount of hours, the right amount of balance, you know, and, and, and what, what's actually really cool with a lot of the young women that we get, they're already coming in with this incredible ability for time management, you know, because it, it's not a high school sport, right? Exactly. So they're swimming or running with high school. They're going out and finding a tri team. These kids take, have maybe their first 10 days on campus where they're like, Oh, I'm a little overwhelmed. And then they're in it. Like no problem. Yeah. You got it coach. Like most of them, even like now I've got girls, you know, that are in their freshman year that are taking 18 credits in their second semester. Like, oh, I really, I got this. You're like, what? Are you sure? Like, <laughs> oh, it's insane. Like, it's absolutely like we have one of our young girls. She's in mechanical engineering and, and we, we have academic wow. coaches and they, you mm -hmm. know, spend the four years where we make sure they're tracking and help them with a lot of things. And and we were talking with her and and um, she was like, yeah, you know, so this athlete's going to going to be doing this. And I'm like, oh, wow. And she's like. You know, honestly, she's like, these are the hardest courses ASU has to offer. And she's like, this kid, I'm not even worried. And you're like, okay, all right, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you, you don't you don't get a scholarship or you don't get into university and race at a national or continental or international level as a teenager and not have some time management skills. I mean, you, yeah. there might be times when you're overwhelmed, but traffic's are very bright usually and, and oh, very yeah. academically sound. Um, you know, in terms of development, I, I think school does fit really well with that. Um, Philosophically, I like the British development system, which is uh, an underpinning of theirs is a decision making um, uh, uh, focus mm -hmm. to not. I was talking to an, a coach about Sarasota that got, you reminded me earlier. They got the swim got canceled, got made into duathlon. Coach said, Should I have prepared my athlete for the eventuality that might be a duathlon in the training or the, the mindset? And I'm like, No, there's <laughs> 50 different outcomes you can have there. I said, if you gave the athlete a skill set to 
um, accept challenge and deal with what they can control, calm themselves down and, and refocus, then you've got it. And to me, the British development system seems to emphasize that, at least in their documents, this decision-making thing, like empower the athlete with the, with the general decision-making skills and analysis skills, and then they apply them in the race. I'm sure the Brownleys heavily influenced that. Um, I, you know, I, looking through this and thinking about development, one, one thing I really struggled with, um, it kept me up a lot is I had a lot of stress fractures amongst the female athletes in my group for a bunch of years. Um, and I didn't feel I was out there driving crazy run workouts and stuff. We still had them and, um, it drove me nuts. I didn't think they were doing anything wrong. I just thought I hadn't got the formula right. And, um, so that was a hard lesson and I, I don't like having injured athletes, of course, and um so i think in terms of a uh women in particular uh, not to put everybody in the same box but i would probably lighten the run load a little bit in the late teen years and u23 years um and load on more swimming and cycling especially the way women's racing happens at the international level now like it's front pack or bus sort of thing and try to avoid those big missed training windows that we had with some athletes and and probably predispose them for injury later on in their careers as well um i sort of have observed that as women get into their mid and late 20s they seem to be a little more resilient i don't know if their bone density bone density doesn't typically improve for women past um past the early 20s to be honest but there seems to be some sort of injury resiliency built in and you can layer on some volume then so yeah. you know if i could go back and change some things um i would change the frequency of how i ran so i i learned um from a good sports med doc and a few good coaches to especially susceptible injured athletes to put at least a day between their runs um, and not worry, like what you get, you get three runs one week for the next, or we'd even do doubles on a day and then no running the next day. And then another run on day three sort of thing, but to spread things out. And um, we had some really positive changes with that, with athletes having a lot, well, no injuries, touch wood after a certain time. Those, but, those running protocols, Craig, uh, for me, it, it was a game changer. Understanding yeah. that the importance of the recovery period, because it's it's so hard to run, like so hard, so impactful. Yeah. So, it, and this is it. It's not metabolic or fuel recovery. It's soft tissue recovery. So you can absorb load. Um, yeah. And another thing that the, the NTC did in the last few years is they just implemented, you know, walk runs for senior athletes sometimes. A one-minute yeah walk every 10 or 15 minutes on an easy run to extend them out and um you know it seems to work just looking at the outcome which is the injury frequency or severity seemed to work and so um you know if i could go back again as a development philosophy i would have done a little less run load um even though i knew that nationally and internationally it was sort of in the in the middle of what was going on but it was probably the frequency of how i loaded my runs that, that created some of those issues and um uh, but yeah, just give the kids the skill set. I was just writing some other notes here. And, and one of the things I admire of what I would call senior or experienced coaches is a lot of them, they're characters. A lot of them are super, like real characters. Um, but they've all got these sayings. They've almost boiled down their philosophies to like 10 different sayings. And that can be a bit dogmatic. You can kind of get stuck in the same thinking all the time. But I, I found them to be quite creative coaches. But they've, they've just boiled down and refined their, their focus um to these these quick lines that they're they can say to their athletes and reinforce with them in the context of a workout or a race to the point where the athlete sort of knows without the coach even being there what the coach would say and and getting back to like early on when you talked about the art of it right or a coach who a very experienced coach who writes it up and, and can explain why he's doing what he's doing but it works and that's the art and like that all blends in with these coaches who've been around so long they've really refined what they're doing down to some very simple philosophies that that really work um and uh anyways I, I i definitely admire that about coaches that that have had more experience than me um yeah. you know through my journey i've got like really and probably the hardest questions which i really doubt we'll be able to answer in a couple of minutes but it's worth it it's worth it do you have your athletes systematically do altitude work and how many days in duration and how much time before a race? That just, just the, the altitude piece, just that we need an episode. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I love altitude. I can't, I, I can't use it with my college kids. 
you know, it, we, we can't leave class, you know, so I can't go away. Um, and, you know, we don't have the budget to build like an altitude room. But uh, the earliest time we got a cat altitude tent, I think I love tents. Um, because as a coach, you like to control things. So <laughs> to me, I really like tents. Um, because I've had athletes that are they'll respond, um, you know, with, with their blood values, you know, they're they're definitely responders, but they can't train at altitude. And um, but that that was the 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 fun side. Like uh we we had Randy Wilbur, who was our senior exercise physiologist with uh, the US team, and he was uh, very well written. Um, I think something like five or six books on altitude kind of considered in North America, like, uh, at the forefront of it. And, um, but I'd done a fair amount in the early two thousands, loved our tent. You know, I definitely, I think Lance at one point had asked me to do Simon's protocols in 2002, but, uh, I was definitely very big into it and, uh, really, really enjoy it. Um, it's a great tool. Uh, you know that you got your 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 base like 21 days you know kind of thing i think is you know kind of still standard but uh um you know that's a pretty good one what's nice about the tent you can top up whenever what was really cool is a lot of the stuff i was doing in the early days when i got to the three and a half years i was at the us program we were able to test you know blood values all the time so i was able to validate a lot of stuff that i kind of figured out um and one of the bigger ones like in the case of sam she didn't train well at altitude. She'd actually would almost detrain, but her hemoglobin mass and things would really come up. So one of the things that um, I was pretty big on because one of the big targets was 2006 when uh, with the 70.3 worlds. So what I wanted to know is how long she could hang on to the blood values when she was out at altitude. So we would be able to do that. And she was actually able to retain not even going down a fraction six to seven weeks. Wow. And knowing that, then that's how we basically plan the attack for, you know, all the big races. We're like, okay, you'll be in altitude, you're going to suffer, you're going to get the base. Ball. What's that? You train base, then you get down and you just hammer it for six and weeks. just hammer the, yeah, the, the intensity, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. that worked. And, you know, she left everyone in the dust, you know, and, and uh, so that, that's something I really enjoyed. But everyone's different, you know. I mean, there was people... Andy Potts and Hunter Kemper are two people that I've seen that lived and trained in altitude and, and never even, you know, was a beat, you know, and for them, it's amazing. They could go, I mean, Hunter, we used to joke, and I'm pretty sure that's one of the reasons when they, you know, with the I2 had for the anti-doping had to come in, you know, 48 hours before. He used to show up in Mululaba, like for the World Cup, the night before. Like that mm -hmm. was how close he could go and still get a podium and it was no problem. Like that guy was, you know, just a freak when it came to that. Just, it was mm -hmm. amazing, you know, so... Yeah, you see, and that's like, I think the biggest lesson for me and Craig, I'm sure you got a whole heap to say about it as well, but was everyone is individual, every <laughs> single athlete, whether it's tent or at altitude, how long they need out, how close they can go in, you got to work it out with each individual athlete. But I, 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 I really like it. But at the collegiate level, we just don't, we just can't, you know, we can't go away. We can't leave class. We can't, we can't travel. We just can't do that. To, but so, you know, maybe down the road, but I, I, I do like it. Yeah. You? No, I, I agree with that. It's uh super individual. Some of it is just some people desaturate at fairly low altitudes and some desaturate they have to go quite high to get that effect. If that's what you're looking for. Um, uh, I haven't done a lot of it. Uh, same issues. Most of the, most of the crew, I didn't work for the university, but we trained on the university facilities uh, they had us as a guest basically and the most of the athletes were in school um and it just wasn't feasible to go for very long times and if you're not going to go for you know if you're only going for a 10-day camp you're probably not going to go to altitude um so it does have to be monitored i would i would say that the research is pretty clear that you need to know what your bloods are before you go up oh yeah and you need some really good iron stores um because you can't you can't even you're yeah, at least the studies in runners, you can't really maintain when you're up there. So you can't add supplementation and just keep your level. You need to go up a bit loaded to make you know, the adaptation. One of the you, biggest lessons. Oh, sorry. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Oh. I was going to say one of the biggest lessons. And it's funny because when I came first to the U.S. and I was like, hey, here's my understanding. And Randy was like, wow, like he's like, that's exactly it. You got to treat it like a load. So I always yep. look at it. It's about like eight hours or so on the week. So yep. if you're normally training 20 and then you're going to altitude, you know, you got to recognize that if you're starting to really do your volume, it, it's a load. So you have to, you know, it's almost like you're training it at 28 hours. You know, it's a very simple way 
it's how my brain gets a hold of things. But I was like, oh, well, this is a load that you really, really have to recognize and and respect, you know. But, Absolutely, yeah. That uh, most most coaches that have experience that I've talked to say the same thing. Um, and uh, I, I think the other thing they really emphasize is just repeated exposures that yeah. over the course of a career, repeated exposures of two to three to weeks and, and possibly longer when you go longer or when you get older are really effective and that, you know, it's a cumulative effect for a lot of athletes. So you you really have to be healthy and fairly recovered before you go up. You can't go up smashed. Yeah. Um, and you need to, especially your first few times, um, and especially if the younger athletes, you need to go fairly uh, conservative, which is tough for them to do. And then in terms of coming down, um, I don't have nearly as much experience as I only ran one or two altitude camps. And so we didn't have enough data to compare people I've spoken to have had really good success on day three, uh, and four um, and sometimes five. So they come down quite tight, not quite the hunter camper model, but darn close. Um, and, um, and then there seems to be like a, a sort of getting on to about three weeks, kind of that 10 day, 14 day seems to not be great for most athletes after coming down. But I, it's one of those things where it, it's sort of, you almost end up in working an anecdote because the, 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 you know, if you're reading studies, their averages, the group mean of a bunch of usually college age kids, sometimes elite athletes. But if you look at the individual responses in those, of those papers, you'll see the responders and non-responders. So the average doesn't really mean much to you. And you'll find the same thing in your group that you need to figure out, uh, and it's logistically hard, but you need to figure out for each athlete how much they can handle, how high they have to be, how many workouts you can do together as a group versus separating out. And, um, and you need to monitor over time repeated exposures to, to see if you're getting a benefit out of it. But um, yeah, it can be super effective. There's yeah. definitely a trainability factor, like as you get exposed and you get more mature. And yep. as you said, Cliff, there is also that there's a learning curve per athlete because because they respond differently from an athlete to another. So mm -hmm. the big one, too, like, uh, you know, and it's funny because I also had probably about three. Well, actually, no, almost probably six years of being in a tent myself as a non-athlete at that point. So you can see what altitude really disrupts your sleep. So then your recovery is getting impacted, right? So there's a there's a lot of balance, but you know when you you know I've always been someone that likes to tinker. So I think as a coach, it's really appealing. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, there's all these little tricks too. And then you have someone that might not. They come in whether it's two thousand meters. You can go up much higher and then come down. You go for your first three to five days and then go, and then you're actually like, oh, okay, now I don't feel so bad, you know. And then one thing we were very very fortunate at the Olympic Training Center was. Um, I know it was interesting, but I got in and I kind of took it to a, another level. They used to use supplemental oxygen just for tapering, where I actually brought it in and used it entirely for my training. So mm -hmm. you can have someone do a run on treadmill with your supplemental oxygen actually getting right down to sea level. And then in the middle of that, you know, we would do the same. I mean, I had, I had Hunter do, you know, almost sometimes close to 40 to 48 minutes of, of intensity on a tread, uh, sorry, on um, compu trainer and go immediately to runoff. And one of our favorites was a 5k and then like three by 1k or a 5k and three by a mile. But that was all with supplemental oxygen. And you're just, you know, you're cranking out what you would be doing at sea level and it's highly impactful, but same thing. You have to really respect what you're looking to do just like you were saying craig when you come into a camp you got to come in rested come out of a camp you got to get your rest even for those sessions i knew how much it was going to take out of the athlete so it was one of those like highlight of the week go in a little you know low come out mm -hmm. you know maybe just swim the next day a little lighter aerobic you know just like so you can really absorb it right that was the biggest thing you wanted to have that adaptation but you didn't want to you know you don't want to crush someone with it but that was that was really fun to play with that Guys, I said I had planned an hour. We're going to be going an hour and a half. So this is this is what's going to happen. I'm going to have to reinvite you to another podcast. So cool. It's yep. it, seriously, guys. It's like we can go on for hours. Obviously, you know us three. When we start talking about coaching, this can go on forever. But like, I'm um, just just to finish off on a, on a really good note. I'd like if if we're if you're a young coach. Cliff at 20, Craig at 20 years old. What would be Cliff now at 50 ish? Are you 50? <laughs> You're 50, right? 51, man. 51. All right. So, what would Cliff 51 say to Cliff 21? And what would 
Craig. How old are you, Craig? 48. Oh, so you're the, okay, you're the young guy here. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> well, what would you guys say to your younger self? Like, one thing. It's going to be a journey. <laughs> <laughs> Buckle up. It's going to be fun, though. No, it's the most rewarding thing, but yeah. Save more money. <laughs> <laughs> Craig? Um, it's going to sound cliche. Enjoy it more. You know, I should have taken an extra day when we were overseas to the museums in the city. I should have. Um, I always tell my athletes, if, if, if they could, if, if they could, Step out of themselves, Cliffy. You said this with the bird's eye view. If they could step out of themselves and see themselves as a, as their competitors see them, they'd be blown away. They'd be so much more confident. So, you know, just you're always trying to you're always trying to improve, and sometimes you don't stop and just appreciate what what you've got. And I I was just gifted with opportunity, and God, I was gifted with a, with incredible athletes, like just amazing talent to work with. Um, yeah, so I, I did appreciate it, but I I would have would have taken it in a little more, I think. That's the, you know, it's part of it, but it's also the curse of it. Like, you just are on the treadmill and you never get off. And yep. I take that pause. Like, the, the book I'm reading right now with Pep, it's like, I mean, hey, it's great when, you know, he was making millions as a player and so he's able to do it. But I know after he came on the first team, Coach Barcelona, um, up until I think 2013, and they won everything champions league 13 trophies like no one's ever done that right and he took a sabbatical he took a year off you just basically walk away and i'm like man i i i would that's one thing i'm like you know like i wish i i did that or maybe i still can but i i think i could probably put another 15 20 years on my coaching career because that's i was like that's smart i've never done that not smart enough just grind (laughs) yeah well, Absolutely. guys, thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. Like, you'll be reinviting on this podcast for sure. But, like, <laughs> su- super appreciated. So, thanks a lot, guys. And we'll have a chance to discuss um, further for sure some coaching yeah. subjects. So, cheers, guys. Have that a good one. Great. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Bye. C'était encore une fois un super podcast, un épisode numéro 4. Euh, vraiment, si vous êtes un fan de coaching, fan de triathlon, euh, vraiment, là, j'ai pas de mots pour décrire à quel point. Une belle expérience ce soir en compagnie de Cliff English et Craig Taylor, deux de mes très, très, très bons amis. Euh, on est de retour mercredi prochain, 19h30, encore une fois avec un autre invité passionné. Je vous rappelle que vous pouvez toujours réécouter nos épisodes parce qu'ils vont rester surtout sur ma chaîne YouTube dans la playlist Alex Reno Show. Fait n'hésitez pas à les réécouter. Si vous avez des questions que vous n'avez pas eu la chance de poser à mes deux invités ce soir ou en réécoutant l'épisode, vous pouvez toujours m'envoyer un petit message ou mettre le, votre question directement dans euh, le, les commentaires et puis je vais me faire un plaisir de, de rapporter vos questions, mes deux amis, et de vous rapporter la réponse. Donc, sur ce, merci beaucoup encore une fois. On se retrouve mercredi prochain pour un autre Alex Reno Show. Salut tout le monde.